might win because the ideas are so damn good and so damn necessary, and that's exactly how we're approaching this campaign. Next, I want to just show a short video of Christina. We went to Seattle in January, and we created these videos, and it was, didn't have any high tech or anything, so this was a video we did. Uh, mine was so bad, it ended up on the cutting floor. <laughs> but it was now a dress what's happened? Rehearsal. Now it's what? It was a dress rehearsal. It was a dress rehearsal. But now what's happened is, is that the campaign's got an interest, and if you go to our website, www.votesocialism.com, you will see some videos done by other people that actually are very good. It's a five minute video. It raised a huge number of the issues that are in the campaign and what the campaign's about. If you don't know about the campaign, the slogan is. Vote for the greater good instead of the lesser evil. And you know, if you vote for the lesser evil, you're still voting for evil. And how can social support evil? We don't support evil on principle. We support good. Right, right, right. And this is a bold, positive campaign. That's one of the things that made the difference in the debates we had in California. So I'll just give a little background. I went to California to, to seek the, the nomination for the Peace and Freedom Party, which is a 40-year-old 40, 40 party that has maintained ballot status in California through ups and downs since it started in 1967. And they allow other people to run on their lines since they're a, a candidate. So I had these debates with the Socialist Party, which everybody knows, the oldest Socialist Party in the country. The Socialist Party, the Party for Socialism and Liberation, which is a party that was founded in the, in the late 90s. And then the Justice Party, which is Rocky Anderson. He was the mayor of, of Salt Lake City for two terms. And so it was a very interesting debate. That was one set of debates. And then there was a broader debate with the Green Party candidates, people that are fighting for the Green Party. And that was Jill Stein, who's a uh, vied before and lost. She lost to Nader. Nader was the Green Party last time. And then Roseanne Barr, who she's trying to get to be the candidate for the, for the Green Party. And the real, the real issue in the, um, in the debate was, does capitalism work? Can capitalism be fixed? Or can, the capitalism doesn't work? And that was our contribution, mine and also the Party for Socialism and Liberation. That was our contribution to say capitalism doesn't work. We need to really change it because it's a what we're facing the economic crisis is a structural crisis of capitalism. Mm -hmm. It is deep. It is very deep, and we're still in the middle of it. And hopefully, some of the ideas of this campaign can help bring us out of it a little bit stronger than we are right now. So let's roll. My name is Christina Lopez. I'm running for vice president as a Freedom Socialist Party candidate with Stephen Durham will be running for president. I've been politically active for over 20 years, beginning in Phoenix, Arizona, where I was born and raised, and now in Seattle, Washington, where I'm the organizer for Seattle Radical Women, which is a socialist feminist organization. My focus is building a fight back against the budget cuts for here in the state of Washington. Like a lot of states, the state is cutting back on education, health care, and essential state services that people need, especially right now when the economy is still in a recession. The Freedom Socialist Party is running a write-in campaign because the elections are not democratic, because voters are basically given the Republicans or the Democrats as choices. Both parties are the parties of the elite. Their interests lie with corporations, Wall Street and the super rich. The Republicans and the Democrats get easy access to the ballot, whereas minor parties are left out due to restrictive rules and regulations or the lack of funds. That's why we are running a write-in campaign. Frankly, the fact that we only have the choices between the Republicans and the Democrats is a problem, and it's also the reason why nothing changes. For instance, in this economic crisis, where record numbers of unemployment also caused an alarming poverty rate, where 48 million people are living in poverty right now. 48 million. And the solutions that are proposed by both parties are austerity measures. They are cutting education, social services, and health care while at the same time giving tax breaks to the corporations, to bankers, to the super rich. They do not represent your interests. 
when my mother was relying on welfare, she needed a job training program to help her get out of it. She was able to go to school with, with a program to become a nurse, which then enabled her to get a wage and then get us out of the welfare system. These programs no longer exist. They're being cut. The FSP's solution to the poverty problem, it's simple. We need jobs, lots of good paying jobs. And when you look at the unemployment rate, especially among people of color and black workers, it is maddening. It is very clear that affirmative action is needed to address this problem because everyone deserves a job regardless of gender, regardless of race or immigration status. The Freedom Socialist Party is also running this writing campaign because we want to build a movement. For over 40 years, the Freedom Socialist Party has been involved in the anti-war, the immigrant rights movement, the labor movement, and we are using this campaign to build and unite all these movements with a radical program, but also to build on the upsurge that began with the Madison, Wisconsin, and now with the Occupy movement. This is your chance to vote for a future you deserve and also to protest against the two-party system where you're giving them a choice of either Republican or Democrat. Now you can write in Freedom Socialist Party as a way to say you are not going to go along with this sham of an election where you, the only choices are pro-capitalist candidates. The campaign is volunteer-based and we need your help. We need your ideas for fundraising, getting the word out. For more information, please go to our website, www.votesocialism.com. I hope you can get involved, and I look forward to talking with you on the campaign trail. So I don't know if people read the, you know, when I said we're in the middle of this crisis, I don't know if people read the newspaper today, now China's going down. And Europe's going down. I mean, that's been keeping it up, you know. There's, they don't have a solution. You know, they could cancel our debt. The banks do it all the time. It's called haircutting. I suppose like those banks get a little too hairy or a little too woolly, right? And so they just save their system. They cut, they cut their debt. But they won't do it for us. This campaign calls for not only doing away with student debt and ending foreclosures completely, but it calls for, across the board, $50,000 of credit debt. Just write it off for the whole population. How's that for an idea? <laughs> In debt. No, they put our they put us in debt by cutting our wages since since nineteen since nineteen seventy three, and they accumulated all this capital. The only way they could keep the quote the American dream alive was to was to give us credit, and we took credit, and we people bought houses, and they had equity, and they sent their kids to they sent their kids to college, and they did it on the basis of their loans. They tried to blame us for the problem. It's their crisis, not our crisis. We are the solution. They are the problem. It's the greatest transfer of in human history. One out of two people around the world live on less than $2 a day. Is that right? No. no. The wealth of, of four U.S. citizens, Bill Gates, Paul Allen, Warren Buffett, and Larry Ellison, a few years ago possessed the equivalent of the GNP of four, the 42 poorest nations in the world with a population over 600 million who had empty stomachs and starving mouths. Is that right? No. no. And the top 1% has a positive net worth of $5.7 trillion dollars and between 1983 and 2007, the number of households with a net worth of five million or more grew by 49 percent. And listen to this, in the same period, the number of households with a net worth of 10 million or more grew by a whopping 600 percent. They are wow. taking our, what, the wealth we create and concentrating in their own hands and then their system's falling apart. Because they're, what we produce by our labor, by selling our labor time, has no value to the capitalist unless we pay money to return the value that's in the commodity or the goods and service and then return it to the money for them. Because they're not about producing for human needs. They're about accumulating capital. That's, their, that's what they're about. It has no value. A quart of milk has no value to them unless there's a person there who can buy the quart of milk. That's the problem. 
And then the bottom 40% of the population, the world's population, has a net worth of zero, you know, credits and assets. And single women of color between the ages of 26 and 40 have a median income of zero. That means that over half of them have more debt than assets. So this itself uh, is the greatest um, testament to the ravages of racism and sexism and the combination of what happens when, when, um, when oppressions are stacked upon people in the same body. And we're for saving those bodies and all of humanity, the human body. And then the other thing I said on the campaign trail was that the only power, the truly the only power greater than the, this ruling class that is you know, destroying the world, destroying the environment, I mean, the most vulnerable people, the most vulnerable actors, the most vulnerable aspects of the world are seniors, children, and the environment. And they're all being ravaged terribly. That's right. But the only power greater than this capitalist class that's, rich, that's in this country is the working class. And it's the American working class. And we've got a lot of problems. And hopefully this campaign will, hope, will solve part of them. We know, but this working class doesn't have its own party. Because as, a, as, a, as Christina said, it's a, it's, a, it's a dictatorship of two parties, two parties of capital. As Eugene Debs, the socialist that got five million, that got a million votes while he was in jail in the 1920s, he said that every four years they give us the opportunity to choose who's going to oppress us, how they're going to really screw us in the different ways. And the other aspect of it is the money part of it is, I read another book that was talking about how the capitalist, set, the capitalist class during the, during the upsurge of the 60s and the, with, the anti, with, the, with the war, thank you, with the Vietnam War, they spent more in that campaign than any other time because it took that much to consolidate their own forces, how they were going to actually, actually exploit us, and also it took that much money to actually congeal their own differences among themselves, which really does, isn't a qualitative difference for us. Difference for us. But, so the working class really needs its own party, and it needs, a, it needs a party like the Freedom Socialist Party as a party that can consolidate that, that belief and that hope and that optimism and work on the concrete problems that our class has. It's a powerful class. It's not a, it's not a defeated class. We've never been defeated in this country, truly, totally defeated. Segments of the class have been more oppressed, but as a class, we've never been defeated. They want to make us the problem, but we've got prob make us the Make it like we're the problem, but we have to believe in ourselves and our own class and our own um, own solutions. And by doing that, we get we get strength when we really address our problems like racism, sexism, homophobia, anti-immigrant prejudice. And the platform that I passed out is part of that. And a, and so a party like the Freedom Socialist Party is what the class really needs. But it's not just us. We don't say we're the solution to the whole class. The class also needs a labor party, a party that's going to organize it in a mass way. The, the labor, the people that are in unions, and the people that are unorganized, and really stand up for immigrants. And we really need that in this class. And the Freedom Socialist Party is just as committed to building that as it is to building the Freedom Socialist Party. And a party, that larger party, like a labor party, would be a tribune for the people. The people could go to a party that was broad, where people, that consolidates a lot of dissatisfaction that's, that's floating around now, and is becoming clearer to everybody. And people could go with their problems, and that, class could, and that party could address them. So, to conclude, what would I do as president? <laughs> First, I would free all political prisoners. That's a long struggle we've been fighting for over almost three decades for Mumia Abu-Jamal. He would be the first on the list. Lynn Stewart, who's the people's lawyer. Leonard yes. Peltier. Leonard Peltier is next on my list. Oh, and nice. Bradley Manning. Yes. Oh, great Bradley Manning. And I would also legalize all drugs under community control. Yeah. All drugs. Put them under community control. Let the community decide who has drugs and who doesn't have drugs. And give drugs to addicts and at the same time not treat addicts as, as, um, as criminals, but give them what they need in terms of rehabilitation. Take the profit out of drugs. You know, they make it sound like it's drug cartels. Yes, it's drug cartels on the very, on one level of it, but it goes into the banks, and that's another problem. It opened the books of the banks. The Whoa. bosses say they're having a hard time. Open your books. We'll sit down and negotiate with you. <laughs> if you'll open your books, <laughs> we will open the borders. 
Open the borders because borders exist for a reason, a historical reason, but now we're in a globalized world and the only purpose of a border is to keep a group of people, to, to, to keep the group of people enslaved behind borders so that their labor can be exploited. And the backwardness of anybody who doesn't recognize the, 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 the contribution, not only that, that immigrants are making today, but the contribution that immigrants have made to this country. And people need to read the book, The Jungle. I just read it last week. I got it on the campaign trail and read it. It is a, it, you can't be against immigrants and read that book. It's got everything. It's got everything. It's got usury. It's got, you know, prostitution. It's, got, it's all about the, you know, why, you know, why prostitution happens. It's got, it's got, it's an expose of the packing house. But more than that, it's an expose of the mistreatment of the animals and the mistreatment of the workers. And that's what's lost. A lot of times people talk about it. They only talk about the mistreatment of the animals. But there's a real effort on the part of this socialist up in Sinclair to draw the connection. I bring home all troops, including mercenaries. And I would close all U.S. bases right away. And I overturn NAFTA and the wrong trade deals and oppress workers here and exploit workers around the world. And I would take on, like, as use the power of the presidency to take on this whole reactionary thing that Obama even referred to when he said he gave, he, he's, he's now, he's of the opinion, he's evolved to the opinion that around gay marriage, he said he wouldn't touch the idea of states' rights. States' rights is a very reactionary part of the U.S. Constitution. It's been used, actually the federal government has taken on states' rights. They took on states' rights in 1960. 65 with the civil rights legislation because there was a movement that made them do it. Obama could do the same thing. There's precedence for him to take on states' rights when it comes to gay marriage. That's where I'm critical of Obama. And I would you take on states' rights also around abortion. You know, states' rights, basically the Constitution, these guys that follow, that, you know, these guys that set up this country, they were smart, you know, they were very smart, but they they, they were so smart that they disenfranchised three quarters of the slaves, but let them count the South, let the South count the slaves, Dis, disenfranchised anybody that didn't have any, you know, they were smart for themselves as white men. They were smart, and they were white for themselves, and they, and so the point I'm trying to make is, <laughs> is that, is that as a result of that, you know, the South really has run the country. There have been more, there have been more, presidents from the South than any other way, and, and all around the issue of states' rights. So that's we have to be against state, the states. You know, the Democrats are so hypocritical. He, he concedes to state rights around the issue of gay marriage, right, and abortion, but the Democrats are fighting like hell against states' rights in, in terms of the suppression of the black vote. Is there anything more cynical and anything more complete, completely, completely whatever? <laughs> yeah. Dishonest. Dishonest. Yeah. And we we'll take on the issue of, uh, around immigration too. Arizona with its immigration law. So, so that is, that is, okay. The last thing I want to say is that is that you know we really need your help. This is a grassroots campaign. Come campaign with us. You know, people do stop when you say I'm running. You know, we're running for president. I mean, that's a very, it's a very bold step. You know, and we want to get the ideas out. And who knows, we may be in the White House in November. <laughs> hey there, you heading into that booth? <laughs> Why do you hold your nose and vote for the same corporate creeps? <laughs> hey there, you with your hopes and your dreams. Why waste your time on one you know will never grow the seeds you sow? Better forget him. I have a better idea. Skip the old dog and pony show. Even if it seems queer. Won't you take this advice? I'll hand you like a comrade. Go home and sharpen that point to a T. Have some lunch, meet me back here at three. Then we'll go in together and write in FSP. When FSP decided it would run a couple candidates for president by president for which it has a mandate, the membership excitedly did fully swing to action, and Betty's little Prius even doubled its own traction. 
Steve Strauss down there in Baltimore felt closer to the Delaware. Jed took his magic marker and designed the pencil thingy there. And Susan calmly went to work concealing in her mania. I wrote these words while sitting in a cabin in the woods in Pennsylvania. Mm, this one has two pages. <laughs> well, Stephen then decided that he'd go to California to garner votes for speaking and glad handing door to Doria. <laughs> Debating Roseanne, Rocky, Jill, and others not repeatable, he kicked their asses one and all with arguments unbeatable. <laughs> this campaign is quite something when you really stop to think about the fact that so few people could do so much with so little clout. <laughs> Considering some years ago from Freedom Hall in Harlem to Albany we ran, but then we didn't get a quorum. <laughs> Right, you just might get something you want. <laughs> so this year, vote FSP. The future could be so bright without foreclosures and student loans. Instead, we'll all have nice homes. <laughs> And work from ten until three. Soon we'll toss out all those goons, humming their same old tunes each year. We'll write in our folks instead. No Wall Street sellouts, no shills for the corporate regime. Let's junk the whole damn machine. Hey, right in Stephen and Christine. <laughs> when you begin to believe that radical change could actually happen. Then you've crossed the line from passive to action. Reject names you find on the machine. When you begin to believe, we'll all have a role and should stand up and play it. Assess what you know and soberly weigh it When you begin to believe To vote for a fraud is not very noble To write in a mensch seems much more sincere So make up your mind and do the right thing this November Make sure you remember to write very clear. <laughs> this moment divine, this rapture serene. When you finally reject all the crap you've always been handed, you'll feel that your car, boat, and plane have finally landed. Oh, when you write in. FSP. So don't hesitate, make up your mind, do it today. <laughs> Take that sharpener out and buy a case of pencils. <laughs> Practice writing the names that you see up there on those stencils. <laughs> and between you, me, and she, I'll be closer by three to playing this song in D.C. Yeah.